Thanks for coming. Uh, we need to Hang on a second. This voice isn't loud. Yeah, it's not really loud. We're going to start the meeting now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so with that, we are circulating an attendance sheet. So just sign your name to the sheet so we have you recorded as being here. Thank you. And with that, um, the first order of business that you pleasure to meet. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is to adopt the minutes from the April 8th meeting. Um, I got circulated with the agenda. Does anybody have any questions, edits? I move the minutes be accepted as circulated. I second. All those in favor? Thank you. And I think with that, the next item on the agenda was to take a look at the, the project plan timeline. I think Charles, you've worked on that. Charles, you've worked on that. Have something for us? Yeah. Um, so made a few edits to this uh, change from phase three was going to be uh, public. Uh, review, change that to options, workshopping. So um, with the communications committee doing such a great job, uh, we just want to make sure that as we get to that session, we make it well known that the public is welcome to come in rather than us circulating things and waiting for feedback. We'll just um, really push to, to ask for uh, public comment, things like that. Um, so where we are today on uh, April 15th is starting in the second half of our analysis phase. So we have two more sessions of um, uh, subcommittee analytics work, and then we will move into options workshopping from there. Um, the next key milestone is the um, presentations of the subcommittees on the 22nd, and then presentation of the public survey data on the 29th. Any questions about timeline where we're at or where we're going. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Karen Presentation of subcommittees. Are we all going tonight or are we having like I know finance uh, no uh, yep. moments going tonight. So I think the Maybe next something. the next item on the agenda is what those presentations will look like. So oh, okay. I built out a template for everyone to use. Um, the, we'll actually only have three presentations that night because the um, enrollment data we're going to get tonight, the communications subcommittee really is an ongoing thing. They don't really have a readout. So we'll just have the readouts from the three other subcommittees. Any other questions? All right. I guess the next item on the agenda is the presentation of the enrollment committee's recommendation in their work. Oh, you Sorry. You can change your order. No, so you're right. You're right. No, sorry. I want to continue on your summit. Nope. I was out of order. Sorry. <laughs> um, so there is a PowerPoint, and I think is Nick going to do the PowerPoint or the group? Yes. I'm, I'm going to pull it up right now. I'll that, but yeah, you're, you got the new version I just sent you. Um, how long do we have for this so I can be timing? Um, it was slated for 20 minutes. 20. Where should I go up there? Maybe? Sure. Wherever you're most comfortable. <laughs> People can hear you better if you're getting there. Give me just one second, Jenna, and I'll pull it up. Okay. Sorry, real quick. I guess the email is, um, and Jillian and both try the email.
emailed agenda and the school website link and on a town, town website link works. Uh, town calendar. Uh, they tried it and Nick tried it. It's not how I got in. Yeah, I couldn't get the link to work from the agenda, right. but the one on the school calendar worked. They appear to be the same link, but. Uh, I can text them the meeting ID. Okay. Okay, so I'll work on it. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jenna McPhee, and I'm representing the Enrollment Committee. Um, we can go to the next slide. So, a quick overview of what I'm going to review in the next um, few minutes. First, we'll start with a review of the consultants for models from the 2022-23 enrollment projection study. Then we'll dive into the three major factors that will affect um, the school enrollment go forward and where we've actually seen some changes since she did the study last year. So that's going to be your birth rate trends, your migration trends, and your residential growth trends. And then finally, we'll look at our internal subcommittee's updated rule and projections. And I'll just state up front that really our goal was to take our existing model and plug in the numbers from this year into it. So we weren't trying to rework the wheel. We're just taking the birth rate from this past year, the enrollment from this past year, and um, entering it into in her existing model. So that's what you'll see. Um, I am just going to note up front, if you could wait till the end to have questions, um, we'll, just, we'll just discuss everything at once. All right. All right. So um, as many of you know, when the consultant completed her enrollment projection study this past year, she created four different models. So first was the best fit model. And that is going to be your standard statistical um, model that the um, projects enrollment based on historical trends. So this is going to be your most likely scenario if the trends follow history. So it's not going to be the best scenario if there's um, you know, major residential development, if there's changes in birth trends, if there's some sort of recession. It's just looking at, at our history. So to that point, when the last projection study was done in 2018, it actually wasn't the best fit model that, um, that enrollment was following. It was a higher model. It was the best fit multifamily high. So that's just something to note as we go forward. Um, so next we have the best fit model plus COVID adjustment. Here, the best fit, fit model was adjusted for the higher birth rate trends that we began to see after 2019. Um, it also accounts for the increased homeschooling trend that we saw during COVID. And here, um, this is going to come up again, so, so I want to make a note of this. No adjustments were made on this um, particular model to factor in the increased housing um, that was allowed by the GMO at the time. So inherently, this model accounts for 142 housing units, and that was lower than what we had seen in the past several years. So to that point, that's why she created the next two models, the two housing models. So I just want to kind of put a, make a note of that that the, um, that COVID model doesn't necessarily account for the amount of housing that we've been seeing on average the last few years. So then if we look at those two housing models, your housing impact model is based on future development levels of 190 housing units. And that's what, um, that is consistent with what the town plan are expected for future development at the time of the study, though the GMO has since been adjusted. So she did the study last year, the GMO has been adjusted since, and that's something I'll circle back on. And then your housing impact high model is going to be kind of like your worst case scenario. This was the maximum allowable housing developments. What would, what would enrollment look like if that actually came to fruition? Um, and that was 244 units. And again, this was based on the old version of the GMO. All right, go to the next slide. All right, so here's a quick visual of those four models. So on the right in the blue, you see the best fit model. That's going to be your most conservative model. Um, the best fit plus COVID is the purple line that projects the enrollment to be about 2.4% higher than best fit. So it's just a little bit of an uh, adjustment up there. Then you have your housing model, which is about 5% higher. And the housing impact high is the red line um, that you'll see the, the highest projection there. And that's about 9% higher than the best fit model. Just to give a little bit of a commentary here, when the um, consultant did her presentation for the school board back in February 2023, she said at that time that she favored somewhere in between the COVID adjustment and the housing impact models, but she also <coughs> noted that if births continued to hover around 200, which, spoiler alert, they, they did again this year, um, that her future projections would be too low. So she did express at that point that if the, if the birth stayed at the current rate, her future projections were going to be too low. Next slide. Okay, 
so as I mentioned, there's three major factors that are going to affect um, our future enrollment projections. And the first of those is the birth rate trends. So since the study was completed um, last year, the 10, 5, and 3-year birth rate averages have all increased 3 to 11 percent. Um, and that's what you can see in the gray box below. There was, um, if you're looking at the graph, you can see that there was a sharp increase in births after 2019. So in the consultant's best fit model, which is, again, was her most conservative model, she assumed that resident births would be at the three-year average at the time. So once 77, go for it. So every year that we didn't have births yet, she was assuming it's going to be 177, 177, 177. For the best fit COVID model and the housing models, she used a three-year rolling average. And that's going to be um, a little bit more adaptive to the trends. So at that time, that was... Um, next year, she was predicting 177 births, then 186, 190, back down to 185. So it's a little bit more adaptive. Uh, so for our subcommittee's internal projections, we use the same sort of rolling average method with just adding in the updated um, births that we had from this past year. So pretty simple there. All right, next slide. All right, so if you, if you looked at the pre-read of this, this wasn't on there. We added this slide based on um, some questions that had come in um, that we wanna make sure we, we have clarity on. So um, there was a question that came in about whether we expect the current um, increased birth rate trends to continue. Um, so I wanted to address that briefly. Just at a high level point blank, there isn't a way to predict if the increased births are pandemic related. Do we have some sort of like mini baby boom from the pandemic? Or is that an indication of sustained um, rise in birth? So is it due to something like the growth that we've seen in our town? Again, there's, there's really no way for us to know this, but I do think it's relevant here to look at the census data. When the um, consultant did her work last year, the 2020 census data had not been released yet. Um, so this is kind of what she was looking for at the time, but, but it hadn't been released. So if we look at that, from 2010 to 2020, Scarborough's population increased 17% from about um, 19,000 to about 22,000. Within this, women of childbearing age, so the consultant um, looked at this range of 18 to 44 years. If you happen to watch the video that she, um, where she presented the school board, she called them fertile females, but it's 18 to 24 years. That, that um, age group, for women increased 30% during that time frame. So I'm speaking very much for myself here. That census data leads me to believe that we may not deviate from, from the current birth trends just based on the increase we're seeing, the increase even over that of women of childbearing age that we're seeing in our community. So again, there's no answer here. We can't speculate, but I do think that the census data is, is you know, at least informative to see. Um, but again, circling back to our actual enrollment projections, whether we use the consultant's three-year average or three-year rolling average method, those two methods that she had, our future projections will increase because of how high births were again this year. So if you look at that chart below, on, um, on the left side of the, both those charts, you see that for this year, we had births of 207 again. Weirdly, we had 207 births two years in a row. But you can see how that's um, affecting your, your projections go forward. So if you look at a three-year average, for her best fit model, she used 177. Now, if you look at the three-year average, that's 196. So again, our projections going forward are gonna increase based on um, the continued high births that we're seeing. All right, next slide. All right, so the next enrollment factor um, is migration trends. So that refers to um, the increases and decreases that you see in enroll enrollment as a single class moves grade to grade. So in the past five years, Scarborough experienced an average in-migration ratio of 1.38. So that means that first grade experienced an average increase of 38% from the number of births to the number of children that were enrolled. So in other words, you had a number that was, was born in Scarborough, you have people that are moving in and out, and that net increase is 38%. So if you had 100 kids born, 138 are enrolled, that's that 1.38. Beyond that, if you're looking at the grade to grade migration, which is what's on the chart here, that's gonna fluctuate between 0.98, which you see in seventh to eighth grade, um, as high as 1.04 from first to second grade. 
So you'll see like, for instance, in ninth grade, there's an out migration. That kind of makes sense because at that point you're gonna see some kids going to private high school, um, that sort of thing. So again, because our goal was to keep with the consultant's methodology, we just took these grade specific migration ratios that you see here, these historical averages, and used them to project out with the, the actual enrollment from this year. So there were some places where the, model, the um, consultant's projections had been a little bit high, a little bit low. So we wanted to take those and actually see going forward, what are the new projections for those? All right, next slide. All right, and the last um, enrollment factor that we'll discuss is res residential growth in Scarborough. So on average, 113 new non-senior housing units have been added annually in Scarborough since 2003. Um, but during the years 2020 to 2022, an average of 158 housing units were added annually. Annually, rather, sorry. Um, and this increase in new housing was largely, largely driven by the addition of new multifamily projects. So I know the chart's a little bit small, but the blue in there is the multifamily projects that have um, grown in our town. And then the green is just gonna be your, your single family housing, which has stayed pretty um, consistent. So the reason that this is really relevant is that the impact of a three bedroom multifamily unit is the same as a single family home. So you can see um, that box in gray, the actual impacts here. So a single family home has an average of um, 0.77 students per unit. A three bedroom multifamily unit is the same, actually a little bit higher at 0.8 students per average unit. And then you can see two bedroom, you're, you're not gonna have that same effect. So I mentioned to, to call back to the first slide, I mentioned that the GMO has been adjusted since the study to slow growth by about 11%. Um, for our internal, our internal committee's um, projections, we did not make any further housing adjustments to the best fit model to address this new GMO. And there's a few reasons for that. First, um, go to that, but I want at this moment, there was complexities to the housing, the way that the, the consultant did the housing aspect of her projections that are kind of above our pay grade. We, <laughs> there are complexities to that that we, we wouldn't be able to replicate without making our own internal assumptions. The other reason for that is you'll remember, uh, I mentioned that the best of this COVID model didn't factor in to begin with any sort of increased housing development. So that model accounts for 142 housing units, which is lower than what we've seen in the past several years, lower than what the new GMO is expecting. Um, so if anything, by using that model, we're underestimating the housing. Um, so I just wanna, you know, Note that again, that we're not adjusting the GMO, um, but the model that we're, we're basing our internal projections off of was already, you know, very low housing wise. All right. Okay, so executive summary. Um, so moving on to our subcommittee's actual updated enrollment projections. So just to say it again, really our goal was to say, if we gave the new birth rates and the new enrollment from this year to the, the consultant and she plugged it into her existing model, what would it look like? That was what our goal was, was to use her existing model and just plug in the new information. So to recap the methodology that we use, um, with up-to-date birth rates from 2022, 23, <clears throat> and enrollment rates from 2023, 24, our subcommittee updated um, the birth rate projections going forward using her same three-year rolling average method. Um, the same method that she used for the, the COVID and the housing models. We updated the grade to grade projections with the consultant's historical migration ratios. Those, those ratios will fluctuate from 0.98 to 1.04. And again, the aspect of the analysis that would require more expertise would be changes to the housing trends for the new, the new GMO. So we didn't adjust those estimates at this time. So obviously what our discussion as a group is gonna be is what model do we want to use go forward? So one option, of course, could be to use the new projections that our, our internal subcommittee um, has established with the, with the consultant's model. But if we want to try to exist, um, stick with one of the, the existing models, the housing model most adequately aligns with the subcommittee's updated enrollment projections in grades three to five. You'll see that in 2028 and 2094, 
all of the consultants' um, models are too low in K to two. And I'll remind you, she mentioned that too in her in her presentation to the school board that if births remained at 200, which they have, they were going to be too low. So that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's um, who happened to, to watch that presentation. Um, so for those years for K to two, the committee should plan for projected peak enrollment of around 850 students. And that's going to be in the year. 2029, 2030. Right. Okay, so I'm gonna summarize this a little bit. This is this is our um, subcommittee projections. Again, using the same model that the, um, the consultant laid forth. So if we look at the green, so starting on, on the um, left side, we added the actual burst for this year. So that was 207. So then we were able to project using that three-year rolling average. What will that now be go forward? We also added, you can see in the middle, that, that green line kind of in the middle, we added the current enrollment, the actual enrollment from this year um, to project that forward. So kindergarten was slightly higher than what the um, consultant thought it was gonna be. One to two was kind of lower. The other grades were, were pretty close. Um, so we modeled these numbers go forward to make sure that we weren't overstating either. So because grades one and two were a little bit lower than she thought they were gonna be, we have to project that forward to make sure we're not overstating these numbers either. So I wanna focus your eye for a bit um, on the section on the, on the right, the totals. So uh, the max enrollment here is highlighted in yellow. So this is whether where our max enrollment was, whether it was historic or something we're projecting go forward. So you'll see that in K to two, um, our historic high enrollment projected is 850 in 2029, 20, uh, 2030, and then in three to five is 926 in 2032 and 33. When we think about uh, middle school and high school, those the highest we've ever seen there was at the very top back in 2006. So for the moment, that's not a concern. I want to. Um, I want to just talk for a minute about the number above that 850. So the, the year before we're projecting to see a high of 850, you can see that it, um, the total projection to take for K-2 is 817. And the reason I want to note this is that this is the projection for actual births. So these births at this point have happened. We've had two years in a row of 207 births. The year before was 174. So these three classes that have already been born this is their projection. So I just want to raise an alarm here because if, if these migration radio ratios stay as they have been, stay as an average, we're projecting that those classes that have been born already are going to be 817 versus the max that we've seen previously is in the 600s. Today we're seeing enrollment of about 600. So this isn't so much a hypothetical anymore. Yes, it's a hypothetical because these are projections, but the, this is talking about a year that these kids have already been born. So for me, that raises a little bit of alarm. Something we, you know, we can talk about as a group. All right, so last slide before we, we can discuss. Um, so this is just showing how our subcommittee projections um, are versus the consultant's models. So there's not gonna be one that's perfectly fit, fit because like I said, the births are higher than what she originally thought they were gonna be. If we look at a rural one today, it's a little bit lower than she thought it was gonna be. So none of these is gonna fit perfectly. Um, so like I said before, one option would be to use our subcommittee's projections go forward. Um, they're, th they're theoretically matching what the consultant would share if she had just plugged in her new these new numbers into hers. Um, but you can see here that, as I mentioned before, in 2028 and 29 and four, all of the models are too low in K to two. So the births remained around 200, like she, she said they might. Um, so we need to plan for a projected peak enrollment there of around 850 in the year 2029. For grades three to five, um, if we think about what years would actually be affected by us building, so it's gonna be a, a few years out, obviously at this point. So we think, I don't know, maybe 2027, 2028, when we get to that year, the housing model most adequately aligns with the updated enrollment projections. So if you look, it's hard to see because I know this is small. Um, if you look 
that's going to give you like a little bit of a wiggle room with those years. You are like 19 above our projection, 20 above our projection versus one step down from that. The best fit COVID, COVID model is like right at our projection, one below. It's, I, that might get us into like a middle school situation where we built it and it was too small to begin with. So, um, so all that to say, none of these projections are going to perfectly fit what our subcommittee has, has come up with because things have changed in the last year, the birth rates in the, the actual enrollment. So I guess that's a discussion of, do we wanna use our subcommittees? Do we wanna to try to fit into one of these go forward? Do we want to, I know there's been discussion about working with the consultant again, like I, I mentioned a few times, I didn't even touch the GMO um, in any of this. So that's all I'm gonna say. And I, I guess now we'll discuss. Thank you. So I guess that opens it up. Does anybody have any questions? Comments? Oh, am I calling on people? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, you go. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, relative to the, the data that you've been collecting and the, num the feel that you have for the numbers that you've identified, you think you, your team will be able to come up with enrollment numbers? that you've established based on the data and the research that you've done, a set of numbers that we could use just to project with, I instead think, of trying to compare the different. Yeah, I think if we go back one slide from this, this is our committee's projections. So theoretically, this is, if the consultant used her model and just plugged in the, the data from this past year, this is what the new projections should be. So this should be, pretty accurate, to be honest. Um, my whole spiel on that next slide was, if we don't feel comfortable using our internal projections, we wanna stay with one of the committees or the um, consultant rather's models, though that's kind of where we have to try to fit these numbers in. But if we wanna use our subcommittee projections, we feel comfortable with them, then, then this is what they would be. I have uh, two questions. The first is, uh, it looks like it was flat for the last 10 years till now. A lot of the numbers are like, you know, and, yeah. and I, my understanding is that the projections that was, that was inaccurate, right? Like they thought it would be higher in the 2018 or whenever in the last enrollment. So are you, so 2023, 2024 enrollment, the, the actuals that we've seen this past year are slightly lower than what um, the consultant thought they were going to be. And it's just coming from grades um, one and two. So if we look at those migration radi ratios, typically you see a ratio of 1.02 and 1.04. So we're seeing a little bit of an increase in the number of students from grade to grade. This year for those two grades, there was actually out migration. So that ratio was a 0.96. So historically, only once, one other time in the past 10 years, we've seen sort of out migration into grades one and two. And it happened again this year. So that's why the, the um, consultants' projections were a little bit too high this year. Those are two grades. Are you talking about the consultant from two years ago? The one from this past year. What about the 2018 consultant? It was the same consultant. Um, and, and, and did that, was that an, how inaccurate was that enrollment? So the, um, in 2018, years following 2018, Enrollment stayed pretty um, close to the best fit multifamily high model. So similar to how we had like a best fit, best fit COVID housing, et cetera, she had done multiple models at that point. So it was like the third highest model is where enrollment actually came in until COVID and that obviously messed things up. Okay. And then, so, so there's no, your committee hasn't, I, I was just wondering if there's been learning or wisdom or mistakes you understand the mistakes of the past, if there have been. My understanding was there's that it, it was pretty inaccurate because it's been flat, but that could be my fault. Yeah, the, the hard thing with any sort of projections is that you have to work off of averages. So I just mentioned like those grades one and two. On average, we see a little bit of an in-migration. This year, there was out-migration, there was less kids. So, you know, her, her projection is going to be wrong. So really all we're able to work with is these averages, unfortunately. Yeah. 
So I guess then that ties into my final question, which I think is short is uh, the peak, you know, the 850 and the 926, what happens after that? I, I mean, is it just staying there forever or it, are we continuing to rise? <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean? Like if the burst. So, so if we look at the bursts that are leading to those, those years is where you have like around 200. Um, so that's kind of like our big question mark and, and kind of why I mentioned that census separation. Are we going to stay around 200? Our town has grown 17% and those women of childbearing years numbers were up 30%. So for me, that makes me think maybe like we might stay this high, but that's total speculation on my part. I don't think anyone can say definitively one way or the other. Which group? I'm assuming that the uh, K will be the greatest fluctuation. Because new children coming in. And then that number could be carried on, so to speak. And then they, they come and go in time. But you're using the, the, the K to project 10 years out and another 10. What would that be? This, because of building the buildings. Yeah. That's, the rooms are not going to come and go. Mm -hmm. Once you build the building, they're there. If you run out of space, or you make it too large. Yeah. What I'll say about the um, these migration radio, ratios here is that even though we have a historical migration radio, ratio for kindergarten, the consultant, the number that she really focuses on is this first grade number that if you look at between first grade and, and birth, that, per, that number is actually 1.38. And the reason that she does that is that um, kindergarten has a lot more unknowns. You're gonna see more kids that are in private kindergarten. It's not gonna be really till first grade that you get a good idea of in our town, how many kids are in the school system. Um, so that kindergarten number, you're gonna see more fluctuation than you would for the remainder of the grade. So- um, But doesn't that affect, if, they, if they're actually going to school, doesn't that affect the size of the, of the, of the place that, that you have to have for them to go? Yeah, it, it does. On, on average, that, that birth to kindergarten migration ratio is 1.36, um, but it's been higher and it's been lower. If we look at the 2022 to 23 school year, that number was really high. It was a 1.5. So 50% more kids that were, were born in this town enrolled in kindergarten. So you're going to see some highs you're going to see some lowers. Obviously, with average, it's coming out at 1.36. You're going to see higher, you're going to see lower. Yeah, I have um, two questions. First, um, did you look to see kind of what are the national trends in the US? Um, or what are like the experts saying about the, you know, kind of the COVID effect? And um, what, so, what is the consensus of expert? Yeah. Funny enough, I, I would today was actually reading some articles about like, was this a baby boom? Was it, there's a lot of like, not pop culture, but just like a lot of like Time Magazine, like those kind of articles that, that try to address this. Um, from what I could see, it seems like a lot of communities are already seeing a downtrend. Like that was truly like a blip and they're seeing a downtrend. Obviously that's not the case for us. And that's it. what I'm saying is, is anecdotal. This is just a few articles I read today. So I, I can't really say nationally. And then um, I, I had looked back at how, what has the population actually been um, for kindergarten through two. And in Scarborough, it peaked in 2008 at 753 students. And it dropped 10 years later to 566, 200 students, almost 200 students below the peak in 2008. Yeah. And then it has kind of steadily, slowly climbed up. Mm -hmm. But it does seem like there has been a lot of variation. And has anybody thought about life stage? Like, I know a new development is built. People move in, young families. They start having kids. And, you know, 10 years later, their kids are now, you know, in middle school and eventually they move and, or, and, or there's no new kids coming out of there for quite a while. I mean, we have had a lot of growth, but 
it's it, it's site you know there are cycles so i know when the school board looked at this back in say 2016 they felt that population trends were really um, they, they were not certain what it was showing they felt that they needed to wait that you, you know to try to build something based on shaky data um, is a gamble. And um, although we need to do something, we need to do something. It seems like um, maybe portables are part of a temporary solution. Like if, let's say we built a new building and we knew we were gonna have this three year period that we were gonna have 30 extra kids that eventually they were gonna go away. They were gonna work their way through the system that maybe we don't build for the biggest, the largest capacity that we're going to have ever. I mean, we really don't know. Yeah, I think, of course, with any of these birth rates, they're projections. But the reason on the slide that I brought up that year, that 2028, 20, 29, as being 817, is because, again, that's based on kids that are actually born. Like, if if these migrations ratio stay as they have been, we're going to be up at 800 plus versus 600 right now. Um, to your point, there is a lot of fluctuations we've seen as, as in K-2 as low as 568. But what we're projecting right now is we're going to have at least one, two, three, projected here five, could be more years of 800 plus students. So I, I guess it's like how many years are we how many years are we going to use portable? How many years are we going to say something's temporary to use a portable versus something like a sustained trend? And I don't have the answer to that. I'm just no, no, I, I, I agree. I, I guess I'm kind of thinking out loud, but I, I know that as recently as 2016, Scarborough was actually thinking about closing Pleasant Hill School because they had overcapacity. So, I mean, things change pretty quick. And, um, to, you know, we're obviously not in that situation now. Uh, Sue's question just has me thinking. Um, these numbers, and this might be beyond just the enrollment subcommittee, but these numbers would be helpful for me to see what's the projection for K through two, what's our current building capacity for that age group, buildings alone, what's the capacity for buildings plus existing portables, just because I think your work is great with the numbers, but how does that literally fit into the space we have? Yeah, um, definitely. For the reason why we didn't include the current um, the current capacity is that it seems like there's so much in the air with what up in the air with what the other groups are doing right now. Of are we counting portables in that capacity? That's a good point that you make. We could do like a with portable and without portable and kind of compare it that way because I think that that's kind of it, within our group a big question of like are we portables <coughs> as capacity or not? If I, if I may, Jen, you know, the, the infrastructure subcommittee has that task to once we adopt whichever enrollment model we choose to adopt to look at current capacity against the, the enrollment numbers we, we decide to choose. Yeah, I think that'd be really helpful to us and to the public because we keep saying it's a capacity issue and I think a very clear chart of those three categories would, would tell the story. Yeah, thanks. To add to that, it also when you do compare those, you have to think of how it changes class size. Because if you don't have capacity and you're still trying to fit the same, more kids in a building, class size goes up. Um, <clears throat> and that's something I we were talking about in our committee after talking to the principals. So I did have a question about out migration. Mm -hmm. You had said, um, was it grade one, two? Recently had an out migration. Yeah, do we have any idea why? Like, is there anything that the town knows? Is it homeschooling? Is it because parents are private because they don't like our school? <laughs> like, I'm just curious that that grade level left all of a sudden. You know, we went so low. Right. I don't know if it's because they went from it. Curious. The, um, to your point though about homeschooling that um, the best fit plus COVID model does factor into it or she did factor into it the increased homeschooling that we saw during COVID. So it's, 
it's probably not that. It's probably not that this year there was a ton of homeschooling. I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what would have gone into it, but um, at least she did. She had accounted homeschooling increases into her COVID model. I certainly can't account for all of it, but my dentist and a bunch of other people I know have moved and taken their children with them, obviously, even though they want to leave behind. Right? <laughs> uh, but they've moved to other places like Gorham and so on. So that's why they're out of the school system. So I think you've done a wonderful job. And I think it's a crapshoot no matter what, because there's so many variables. But I think that that's part of it, that some people have moved out of the town for whatever reason, to get a bigger house or whatever, and they couldn't afford it here, they went someplace else. That's true, but the, with these migration ratios, that's accounting for people moving in and moving out. So for most years, the net of people moving in and out, there's a little bit more of an in migration. Um, like I said before, in some years, like ninth, kids going into ninth grade, that's where you see more of an out migration because people tend to go to a private school. That's just gonna be a more common age range for that. Um, for other years, we tend to see an in migration into our schools in this community. You know, what was the year of that? The, the out migration? The out migration. So you see that um, kind of like the seventh, eighth, ninth grades, we see out migration. No, what year? But did it occur just a, a, in the one question. school year or was it, is that oh. a trend across time? It's not a trend. So why that came up is in the 2023 2024 projections, the actuals, um, <clears throat> first grade and second grade was a little bit lower than what the consultant had projected because we saw an out migration in those two grades even though we don't typically see it. There was only one other time in the last 10 years where we've seen an out migration. I just wonder because to, to your point, another thing when COVID happened and the schools shut down, a lot of families went to private schools for that year and some have probably stayed. stayed. Yeah. yeah. Is there a way to find out out migration of pre like babies? Meaning I just had a thought of like, Everyone came to Maine during COVID, get away from cities, made some love, had some babies. And then when maybe went back to the cities, I'm not saying that that happened. Do you have a way of tracking? Not, no, not prior to school. So the first time prior, you, you have the birth rate trends. And then the next like official number you have is kindergarten enrollment. Yeah. So there's no numbers that's like a town-wide number anywhere in between there. So we actually don't know how many babies are still here. From those two birth years. Yeah, like those babies that were birth born last year was 207. Are there still 207 in town? I yeah, know. I see. Okay, good to know. Is there also some level of um, assumption that like a three bedroom home isn't, you know, a small family of three isn't going to leave to have a family of like one moving into that home? So, like, aren't you kind of selling a five? five bedroom home to a family that's gonna fill it with probably children. So some of the out is just getting replaced with new. Yeah, that's why any of these migration ratios are, are a net. And at any point you're gonna see moving in, moving out, moving in, moving out. These are just like averages of what we've seen over the last 10 years. So well, what we're trying to do tonight is really try to vector to, do we accept their recommendation? I know what the recommendation is. Do people need more specific information to be able to make that decision tonight? I think this I have more of a process question. A question for the leaders. First of all, I applaud your committee's work. I think it's great. You're being peppered with all kinds of questions. You can't possibly know about all kinds of assumptions that you have no basis to you know, make. Um, my question is, we were convened to look at the information that was there because to some degree there was a lot of mistrust about what was done before, or that's one way of looking at it. Um, are we in a position just to accept the new approach? Would we serve ourselves better by having whatever the recommendation is vetted by the consultant who has a professional credential? And do we have budget to do that in time? That's I'm not expecting an answer, but I want to propose that. I think not currently. <laughs> the actual betting was based, wasn't that so slated to be? But it's a great point. I'll, I'll just tell you from a project plan perspective, unless 
that we the consultants on speed dial or retainer and we can get them in to talk to us next week we really don't have you know the time i, I but i don't know what the relationship is with with the consultant in the town uh, it's not it's not a relationship between the consultant and the town as so much as it is between the town uh, between the school district and the consultant um, and she has like we said she's done this report twice now um, I know it takes her many months to run the level of analysis that she runs each time she does this for us and it's a contracted service and so as far as I know right now there's no additional funds to contract her for additional hours. And my take on phase one is kind of this committee was tasked with taking a look at that report and, you know, uh, confirming the assumptions that Rebecca Wandel had made and then making a recommendation to us which model we should go with. So to try and smooth in things out a little bit because it's going to be extremely difficult to come up with a set of numbers that will allow us to go forward with our presentations. The numbers that you have, I'm going to suggest are probably workable for the work we need to do. And I have my question would be, is the migration a factor in those numbers? I mean, is it going to make it, is it going to swing a difference relative to the school side? So we use the same migration factors that she used, which was is looking at our 10 year history. What are those migration ratios? And we just updated those go forward with the new birth rates and the new enrollment. So it's kind of like we just plugged these numbers from this past year into her existing model. Where our model wasn't updated was based on the new GMO that, that came out since she did that. Um, so part of the reason we had started with the best fit COVID model as kind of like our base that we updated these projections based off of was that that was already on the low end for housing. Um, we know that with the new GMO, there was some decreases in the, in the housing allowances. This was even lower than that. So we, we weren't really in a risk of overdoing housing by, by starting with the COVID model as our base. We, I, I think as this conversation has been, when we're trying to get to tonight, which I think is April, has suggested is, do you have, what is your specific recommendation for us mm -hmm. to consider? So what we want to do is, do you have enough information, do you feel, to be able to accept their recommendation? That's what we're trying to get to tonight. So I think if you can articulate Yeah, can we go back to the executive yeah. So, um, so looking at the number two and three here, there's, well, there's this and then there's a, th a third option. One, we can use our projections that our internal subcommittee created. Again, the, the purpose of that was we're plugging in the new numbers into her model. It should, it should be kind of the most accurate. That's one option. Number two is if we want to try to fit these numbers into one of her existing models, we can say, what, what kind of closest is this path this is following? And that's where you see number two and three here. So if we look at grades three to five, our suggestion would be to use the housing model. And if we're looking at um, K to two, all of these are too low. She, and she even said that, that was gonna happen if the births remained at 200. So there, our suggestion is to plan for um, a max enrollment of 850. Yeah. So what? I, I just had a quick question on this. The max enrollment's 850. But I, I'm just thinking from just a pure building purposes. How much percentage should we think about of sort of additional to that? So if you're thinking it's 850, but should we add another 20% to it as a possibility that this thing could be way off one way or the other? I mean, I'm more looking up than looking down because we made a mistake two decades ago in the middle school. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't think we the town should make that mistake again. So do you have any input on that? Any modeling on? I don't have any modeling. I The question that, that just spurred when you said that is I'm, I'm curious with Wentworth just being built, how much higher than the projected enrollment we built that for? Because that's probably, we're probably gonna be planning for a similar and I don't have the answer to that. I don't know if anyone here does. So, so, so in order for, to move this on, the discussion on tonight, do you have a clear recommendation? You said there's three options, but is there a, this is, this is 
Yeah, I think I think what we're deciding is, like I said, either we use our committee's sub projections or our subcommittee's projections that we created, or we're doing number two and three here. We're using housing for three to five. Otherwise, your your max is eight hundred and fifty. Unfortunately, because the changes in the birth trends, the, the differences in enrollment this year, there I can't just say this model is perfect for for going forward. It's there's not going to be one. That's that's the point of why we changed the projections. So I. But I know that there's there's a little bit of hesitation in deviating from using one of her existing models just because of the um, validity we have of using its existing consultant model. My personal opinion, I'm just speaking for me right now, is to use our sub, our subcommittee's projections because those are going to be the most accurate with birth rates and, and enrollment from this year. Just to clarify, the subcommittee is the best fit plus COVID, just with updated birth. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Updated birth and then update, updated enrollment from this year. Okay. I think it was on an earlier slide, but I, I want to jump around. What, what was the max enrollment with that updated model? The updated model. Do you want to go back to um, one slide after this? This one here? So yeah. 840 K to 2. So K to 2 is 850. 3 to 5 is oh, 926. Okay. So I, I misunderstood your options previously. So even, so if we went with your suggestion to use the subcommittee's data or option three of just accepting it, either way, we're, we need to plan for 850 students. Yeah, yeah. Okay. To that point, all of her models are definitely too low in K to two. So we went above and said, you need to plan for this 850 instead. None of her models are gonna be sufficient for those particular grades. So I think yeah, and not to add one data because everybody's probably dying in numbers now. But one thing just to go to that migration in 2018, there were five kids homeschooled. If I jump to 23 and 24, there's 76 homeschooled. If I look at the numbers, five-year-olds account for seven of that. Seven-year-olds are less free, but it jumps back up again in eight-year-olds. Those are the highest ages of homeschool children. Parents who have them home probably for pre-K, kindergarten, and for one reason or another, not letting go, bringing them back in. So that's a big jump, five from 18 to 76 currently as of right now. So 76 kids are being homeschooled. Now, how do you project how that's going to change for the trust, especially the trust in a new building and all that? So, so, so I think where we are is the, the recommendation is to, we do have a quorum tonight. The recommendation is to accept the community, the committee's numbers as the basis of our work. And we have that by show of hands, how many are comfortable going in that direction tonight? Without counting Julian County. <laughs> yeah. I, I that's that. I think that's the majority. Yeah, yeah that's a majority. Yeah. Three, three, three. So, I guess with with that sort of show of hands, a motion to accept the committee's numbers for enrollment for our work going forward at this point. So, eight fifty. Accepting. The numbers up. These the, these yeah, numbers here, which do get to eight fifty. Yes, sir. So that there was a motion to do it. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice job. Nice job. Really nice job. We're just not sure or something. Next, next item of business. Charlie, it's yours, the deliverables that you had started to talk about. Subcommittee deliverables. Um, so I drop these templates in each of your subcommittee folders in the Google Drive. I'll just open one um, quickly so we can see it. Essentially, so that you, we wanted, we realized we didn't give you guys kind of any direction as to what are you presenting at the end of this. And so I just put together a quick template, um, which is very focused on um, the tasks, the, the tasking that we received at the beginning of the subcommittees. So. Basically, there's a slide for each question or research topic that was that was given to each subcommittee, and so um, 
I think kind of one way to organize as we get to the next two sessions and get ready for those readouts is to start focusing on addressing the specific issues within those, work to fill these out and, and um, come up with a presentation. So very simple template, by all means, you know, just as Jenna's group had some charts and graphs and kind of made their own, I just made a, a, a template slide for each question or task and use some, you know, whatever fits to get your message across as you need, as long as it addresses the questions. Questions, yep, sir. Yeah, so uh, this will speak on behalf of the finance subcommittee. I have some serious concerns. Oh, I'm just, I have ours pulled up about kind of what we're tasked with presenting. Um, specifically like an overview of assumptions and overview of construction projections. Like we're handcuffed by Harriman right now. We, we submitted all these questions and essentially the response that we just received from Shannon, I think yesterday was, yeah, we provided you all the detail. And it's like, in my view, we can't really, we don't even know, we can't really provide an overview of assumptions. We, we don't even know what the assumptions are like in the first place. Um, so I just have, I'm just curious what everyone's thoughts are, um, particularly for like our subcommittee trying to, I guess, present on something that we don't really have the information to even bet yet. So we had the, we had the same request for the same data. I didn't see Shannon's response yet, so I apologize, but maybe, maybe we just have a small little breakout group and work that through because the, the infrastructure committee Two of ours are also to look at the cost estimates for the renovations we think the buildings need. And so to your point, we really can't do that without understanding the cost basis. So can we just do a little breakout session yeah, so the yeah, other subcommittees fine. can get to work? Yep. So I think with that at this point, we'll adjourn to our subcommittees and maybe re-adjourn at 740. That included the short abbreviated session. That makes sense. And then
So, Dave, for us, our challenge is we're supposed to come out to our Yeah, I told you. 
Some of the wants don't have a state requirement because the, the needs tend to be what the states tell them. So the whole thing, they're all just beginning. Some point, everybody's done. They just got out of charge. And there's a close call. So that was our numbers of the taxpayers. Well, that's what I mean. And that's the budget. I'll tell you. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
need all the separation and all that. I, I think maybe what I'm saying is we're not really, we're not relying on what we're doing. I mean, it's probably good to compare to what they said, but um, you know, if we're going more by what the staff is saying, their deficiencies are. And they're not saying anything. A couple did. Yeah. Privacy issues. Yeah.
I would give her a copy of this. Yeah, yeah, send it to them and say we are ready to go with this. Yeah. We wanted to stop this yesterday. Why is this not done yet? We can do we can just move on this time and then whoever is supposed to get it and have this we can process. So what I think the world will charge that. And setting this up for distracting Um, yeah, you can you can uh, have it right here. Just put it one out. So, so say the more oh, ammo we can get, Jillian to go out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, they've seen that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But now they need the contents. Now they need the contents. We want to get them down. Yeah, I talked to right? Yeah. 
Uh, another ride election discussion. When would that be? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. No, I don't know. Oh, not this but anyway, so we could probably put like a five and then you said you have some ideas. Yeah, I mean, I so I'm I'm sure I I have in my time. So what if we start yeah. Yes. So I can go back and look at that. I mean, I was very difficult. Like it was overwhelming. And then there was a frequently asked questions that was very much related to their um, selling. The project, then there was yeah, very focused yeah. there, but um, yeah, there's really, yeah, obviously, you know, a lot of it's going to have to get in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these are questions, these are the questions that you can pull off the cake website because it's like their website, they're frequently asked questions, and they're all kind of real. But how about um, why is it this year? This year's budget. When they had to put the budget together, they didn't have the actual figure. But there's supposed to be a five year capital plan. There's things like it's got a family center in there, um, but not a real family. The budget that we have right now the town and school budget. I watch part of the school budget. One might think they're leaving the number out to keep the number lower. So I think that nobody, but, um, but it's gonna, they were afraid to come up no one with any number, number for any yeah. number, but then no that's, to come up but it's not zero. Yeah. I know it's not zero. So there are going to be some other things that are going to be around to look at. Yeah. And I think the first one is actually the Saturday. So there's the Saturday. I think I saw the news I think Jimmy is going to there's another one that's three K classrooms. I, I, I don't think we're there yet. I think the first part is we got to get down, get yeah, answer the questions that are presented to us. So I think you've done fantastic. And I, I love the way that you're thinking. I, I think you're similar try outside of them. Just go there for the future. We're just trying to That's why they that's why they can sell them the street. What do you need to do? And I think one of the challenges I have is that there's a lot of questions. I've never been able to do this. I've never been able to do this. I've never been able to do this. There's a lot of financial questions that Aaron will even give us answers. Yeah. At least, right? yeah. I think so. I think we can use the questions. Should we as a group need to try to narrow this? This is what we can tell you. Everything else on here is either we can't answer or it really is better suited for phase two. My, my um, philosophy is always to lead to and acknowledge. Land, as a group, yeah, but, but I can't see any place on this campus that don't. Even if you put it with the athletic field, 
you try to drive through there on the and stuff, it's packed full of people coming in and out. You can't have one. All right. Yeah. All right. So side conversation. That's one of the questions. Yeah. 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 Um, you were just going through the okay. list of so, things that we can. Yeah. So can we send right now? So right now, we can send. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. Um, this was all this copy. This is from the uh, school building advisory committee to assist the development of the school. Just describe some of these cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the school survey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have that already. Uh, school solution. Why now? Yeah, we have that. Okay. Project timeline needs to be proposed. Um. We have just the committee information, yeah. and then, um, but yeah, so those three, yeah. we need to get, get a final yeah. and then contact us. Right now. And then project history, we can finish up right, probably like right now. Then that can go. But then that can go. Well, that used to go to the Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Project history. I don't know. Yeah. 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 They might want to just, 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 just sort of pull their caps. There are certain, yes. There are certain. Yeah. Yeah. After, uh, yeah. That's the last time. 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 The Yes. 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 The question is the project. Yeah, I was and I yeah, I just like all the Yeah, so what should we call it? This is where I go to maybe I guess Yeah, I mean, I suggested in the latest email. Yeah. 
Just taking the gross square footage of the 
building. Yes, I think this is a huge survey. Go to you, what, like a leak survey over here, or just a leak in the school survey? Yes, there's a link somewhere. But yes, so there's, yes, there's a survey. Yes, what he said back to us was this. You could do the both, so you go with like the renovation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the thing, as long as, as, long as they that provide it, it throws per footage, there's a problem with being in the I think my email was like, did anybody else want to? I'd have to go back and look at it. Uh, it'll make it so much easier for well, it's it's like like a little, because if he did, oh no, I can't do that. Oh, so just, so, okay. just product cost, yeah, divided by. Yeah. Okay, that's a school board. 
incorporated in the science guys. They interviewed her. When I just got the light, I was invited to the she was going to give us a Yeah, I know. Yeah, Yeah, that. And then we also talked about. Yeah, the oil the tank now. Are we using the hair mask? Yeah, we could have generated a generator. I'm in I mean, I can throw a slide together and just take you know, what was in the business case and bring her to the I think honestly, like, I think that's Yeah, I think you have to be able to get there. Yeah. 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 Yeah
organized at the moment, but we had a great discussion tonight. So we kind of found our like most top priorities as we're moving through, um, those being safety. We kind of come to the conclusion that for programming, we really do need to find a way to separate gym and cafeteria uh, for multiple reasons I won't get into right now. Uh, priority is focusing on flex space so that it can grow with our schools and our programming more so than focusing on what each room will physically do versus having spaces um, of different sizes and um, let the school, the school and the programming grow with them. Um, and then increasing storage. Um, the need to separate nurse, um, have like private nurse clinics that respect dignity and privacy of the children. That is all. That's good. All right. Infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so we we um admittedly spent a lot of time kind of going around and around um, because now that the time is coming that we're feeling the pressure to start putting a presentation together um we're coming to the conclusion that i think um the folks in the finance committee are coming to where we we actually just can't possibly put i think truthful numbers to the questions that we have here so we've spent a lot of our time thinking about how we possibly do that um if you look at our questions, our questions are almost entirely about what are the costs to solve the problems. Um, and our charge is not to actually produce the solution to the problem. So um, we've um, begun talking about uh, what our presentation is going to begin to look like and how we um, put that together um, for the rough draft for, uh, for Monday's meeting, next Monday's meeting. Pretty big, but that's about <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Communications. Uh, hi, everyone. Let me 
Isabel, uh, co-chair of communications. So we are still working hard on content to put on our website, uh, BCLT. Stay tuned for a few documents coming your way for approval. We really want to get updated information for folks to see about project timeline um, or the history, project timeline, frequently asked questions. We really want to get that going uh, so that as people kind of get more um, visibility into what we're doing, they, they can kind of uh, get updated there. Uh, we're also creating content for social media. We still need for figuring out how to get access to the pages on Facebook, Instagram, uh, but we've got content lined up so that people can uh, Again, see what we're up to, fill out the survey, uh, tune into our meetings, uh, and start kind of understanding what, what assumptions and decisions we're, we're making as a group. Um, and then the last thing we talked about, so website, social media, we've got interviews to be scheduled, stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, we've got updated flyers with the QR code to take the survey online. People should have received the mail survey in their mailbox, that's that random sample of addresses, but it's, it's, it's also open for every plan you want to take. So we're really encouraging more input here. Um, so if you want an updated flyer with the QR code website, uh, come up here. And uh, the last thing we talked about kind of outside of our group, but we're just wondering uh, why the, um, uh, it, it sounds like as the town is having its, its budget conversations, we're, we're curious why there isn't a line item anywhere for, for uh, this capital project, even though there was one last year. We just, we're curious about that. Uh -huh. We could pass that to finance. And, yeah. <laughs> I, I can answer that uh, in real time, because it came up at our um, joint budget workshop last Wednesday. Um, so the school department did not put a capital line item in with a set number for a school project because the school project to them is undefined right now. There is $500,000 in the budget for planning purposes. Um, so phase two of whatever comes out of our work will have some funding um, to be able to hire consultants or engineers or whatever it is that they may need. Um, and then there is also an additional $80,000 line item that's related to getting updated studies or something like that. But in terms of having the school building project in their five-year capital plan, it has not gone unnoticed by the council that they do not have a number in there. And so there was some brainstorming about how to add an asterisk and, and make sure that it gets represented in there before we approve it at second reading. And just one thing to add on to that too is basically we've got all this information ready to go. We've got a great deal of work that's been done. We've got these links and everything. We just really, really, really need access to get that stuff on the Facebook page and get it on the school's website because we're trying to communicate and we can't communicate without those social media rapid avenues. It's just, we need it. So Shannon's on it. But uh, she's probably on a lot of other. Any places. other voices on town council would be yeah. greatly appreciated. <laughs> and in the back of the room, finance. Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, so I guess we're kind of going round and round to um, like the building and infrastructure. Um, we did look at some information that they provided to us, which I think is really helpful for the permanent module idea for the three schools. The numbers and the, the cost per, I guess, square foot, um, we looked at that versus Harriman, and it's such a favorable number. It seems like the Harriman numbers are so questionable. We're just having a lot of questions on trying to follow that report. And if uh, looking at, say, a permanent module, say, for instance, looking at a permanent module number versus what Harriman is saying, say plus for square foot on uh, what renovation or, or anything like that, their numbers are double. So it's really hard to go with the Harriman report. Um, and of course, you know, we wanna scale down cost because 
we all know why. So, uh, so that's a, that's a good observation that we made. Um, and it's really, it's just hard to come together on um, how we're gonna really get the information and get it formatted out on our presentation. So we're working on maybe get together again later this week or something. So that's where we're at. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other comments this evening? There's yeah. been a number of comments on uh, online um, concerning the surveys. Yeah. And I've tried to try and explain statistically why it's one vote per household, but a lot of people are concerned. My wife and I don't always agree. <laughs> I filled out the one and mailed it in. <laughs> she filled out one online. online. She, she don't so count. <laughs> But you know, that seems to be one of the issues that a number of people are starting to talk about. And we've got to give them a better reason than I've been giving them. Uh, because otherwise we're gonna have that distrust again. Why is it only one vote for a household when there's two voters or more than two? <clears throat> Great question. I, I, I know. Mm -hmm. Jillian, any, any thoughts on sort of the architecture of that? And why it's one per household and then I think you can do it online and there's some question you can put your address in so it will it will count in the results i believe is that is that right jillian yeah i think charlie had some uh, so i I'm, I'm going to take a stab at it and yeah. keep me honest but, but i've had a few conversations about this so i'll just share what i've learned on it, it so the the consultant to put the survey together to because your family your household represents the demographic that needs to create the statistically relevant sample. So one per household. Doesn't mean that you and your wife or you, or you and your husband can't both submit surveys. And when, and after the statistically relevant sample is, is then, right? Just like the rest of the community who's doing them will all get tacked on. So I, I filled it out for, for our household. My wife filled one out, mine went first. So that'll be the one that gets counted in, for the statistically relevant sample. And then hers will get looked at and. We don't agree either, so that's okay, right? Um, but we're both also independent voters, right? So, so it will get looked at. Did I get it right? Am I screwing it up? I think that uh, that's that's my understanding. Yeah. Um, so, so I think I, I, that's how what I'm saying. Yeah. So I don't know how to communicate that. I think that's what you. I, I, I think that's what you've been saying online as well, right? Yeah. So. I, don't you think the other question is because your address is on it, the anonymity? Nobody sees the address. The address, only the statistician sees the address. And I've seen that explained, but some people are not bothered. So mm -hmm. I don't know how you fix that, but that's been another one I've seen. You can choose to trust or choose to not trust. I don't know. But are, are both separate surveys being lumped together in one pool of data? So that, that information is not, the fact that some of you folks are submitting multiple for your same house is not canceling each other out. There, there'll be two separate pools, won't there, right. yeah. Jillian? Yeah. There'll yeah. be the statistically sampled pool, which will have results, and then all other. Yeah, so they'll validate the they'll validate addresses. Unfortunately for them, opening up the survey makes that a lot more work. Opening it up online right now makes it a lot more work, but. So, so from a communication <laughs> standpoint. Because so we're the communications committee, what are we communicating to people that have this question? Are we letting them know that the first survey that comes in will be part of the statistical analysis? Pretty, and then pretty the second, much what Charlie said exactly. Is I've been trying to tell them this is how statistics work. You look for a valid amount of like six hundred out of four thousand becomes valid. No, I, I understand that was and my then question. Others come later you know, for opinions. But yeah, the, the basic, the 600 still on account. That's not yeah, that, that wasn't my question, though. No. My question was the second survey that comes in, so we can let people know that's going to be in a pool. Where is that going to be? Is that going to be just kept with the. It just yeah. comes as a separate report out. <clears throat> they give us the statistically valid report, and okay. then they'll give us the second data set separately. Does so, that come after another like set number or a date? State. date. And hopefully, the second one doesn't invalidate the first one. Sure. Uh, it hasn't so far. It, it, it this is this is the give and take you get, right? We had 
we, we, as a town, when we did the community survey, we didn't want to have residents um, not have the opportunity to also express their voice if they weren't chosen for that statistically valid sample. And so we arranged with the consultant to do both ways. And so obviously that comes with an extra level of educating our, our residents, but you know, we still see value. And so far we have not had a, a stark contrast between the two data sets. But again, for, for our purposes, that statistically valid data set is the one that we should, you know, that's, there's a reason we paid for it to be validated. So what I'm hearing is everybody's voice is going to be heard and they're not going to cancel each other out is what you're telling us, or they if, haven't so if far. two people from the same address submit a survey, my understanding is the first one counts towards the statistically valid, and the second will go into that other data set. But nothing should get canceled out for a household. That's what we need to know. To Do we know how many have been? <clears throat> I been don't, in. Sue, and I was going to email the consultant today and see if I could get an updated number. So if I get a response, I'll send the response out to the full SPAC. You know what they say about stats, right? One last question. On that. I'm, I'm assuming that we are waiting for results before this group makes any kind of final recommendations, right? I mean, that, that seems sound to me, but that's probably my take rate. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what was the question? Defer to the chair. I'm assuming that we are waiting for the results of the statistically valid sample before we propose our final recommendations. But we are scheduled to get the results to this in front of this group on the 29th. Okay. So April's going to go door to door and make people pause. <laughs> Wait, that's, that's, what that's, that's what's that's what our time. That's what I think two weeks ago we looked at it. We thought that we'd have it within three weeks so for yeah, the April statistical 12th, sample, April. not for that. The other this pool. Is this yeah, the other pool we would still be waiting. Go ahead, Julia. What? I thought April just said. We were going to get both. Well, yes. we can get, it's possible to get the statistically valid data first if we leave the window of time open for people to continue to take the survey, then it could come in two separate batches. Okay. So there's a give and get there too, where if we want to leave the survey open for longer, but we want to hold on to both data sets and present them both at the same time, then we're delaying that statistically valid data from coming out the longer we keep the survey open. But we also want to keep the survey open long enough for people to... <laughs> in order for us to have it in time for us to move into the options, brainstorming, workshopping, we, I, I, my recommendation, April, is that we, we get what we can get in, in the next two weeks. And I will. If it's only a statistically relevant sample, then that, at least we have something to work with to go forward on. Oh, I can follow up with with the consultant, no problem. Thank you. What's the population? Twenty-two thousand. How many? How many people do you think you've got? Oh, I know. Six thousand. All right. So, thanks, everyone. I know it's eight o'clock. So, thank you. And motion to adjourn. So we'll. Second. All those in, all those in favor? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Because I think there are a lot of really great ideas out there that just haven't necessarily been considered, and those ideas may flow together, and patch well together, and you know, I think the more public we can have present, the better. Personally, um, Joanne, what can this school department do to help those guys? I can understand not giving them access to post themselves, but to get the stuff they're doing onto the school department website or the whatever. The communications committee. That's a work in progress. What's that? That's a work in progress. Oh, okay. Because I can, I would no. I mean, give them the, access. There, that would not. There work was out. A, a long process of how how to. I I can I can side this conversation with you after, so we don't derail this. But it's been there have been a chain of emails trying to resolve, this. trying to get it done, yeah. so to speak, and in the right way and with the right people. So next next week the schedule is the presentations. So there's three groups, right? I know finance, as you've heard, we don't next week is presentations. Yeah, the the twenty second. Well, oh uh, I think we, well, hey, we're ready to go. We're, yeah, we're ready to go. Well, that, <laughs> well, let's do it. Well, well part Our of the report's one sentence, right? Yeah. So <laughs> so I, we can I can make a modification. Yeah. Peter, so I did, because I, I actually thought it was two weeks, and I told them we had two weeks. So next week was they were going to bring a rough draft. Um, so, but but the plan did have uh, April 22nd as presentation of subcommittees, and then April 29th, presentation of public survey data, and then following that on the 29th was when we start workshopping. I thought, um, I thought it was workshop on 29th. Because what we're going to do an hour and a half. Building options workshop 29th. 
Um, and then I had two sessions of that. So basically the first two weeks of May were workshopping, brainstorming ID sessions. And then on the 13th, we create subcommittees to kind of narrow it up front. We, we decide on two or three that we think, you know, ideas that might hold water and then create some committees to really kind of study those and find all the all holes in them or, or like why is this like champion them or whatever. So a theme for the workshop, like should it be one of those, I forget what they're called, where um, people like get together for a weekend but they may they start by, sort of, but they can start <laughs> by giving pitches and then everybody gives the pitch for their different idea and then people kind of give up their idea and join somebody else's idea and they form like little groups. Coach. No, I forget, there's like a name for it for you it's called. I, I know what you're talking about. Um, I've never facilitated that, but we could it would have, work. We could ask Amy and James if they would want to. I wasn't at the counselor corner. Like how did they facilitate who are managers? I'm their sorry. outside consultants who yes. sometimes help the town with bringing people together yeah, like okay. they're they're facil they're discussion facilitators um, oh. and they have helped us in the past on a few different things they helped run a counselor corner live where we kind of just had people come and do this workshopping idea um just because there was a lot of energy at the time and i wanted to kind of capitalize on it but i then i wasn't able to go so did you guys break into small subgroups did people yeah, kind I mean, of pitch and then people move to that group like how no they, they you know, didn't do it like that it was more like um you know where like one of the main topics was like where were you on the scale of the oh, that's right so that's right. um which was which was really interesting I mean I I I'm sure that they could come up with if if they were willing I'm sure that they would be able to come up with a good way of doing kind of like what James just said like Here's some ideas. They have they have offered to help. Yeah. Um, but it's not clear to me whether it's with a fee or without a fee. So uh, we, it, we can explore that. I mean, if they ask. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know what they charge, but I, I don't need it. You know, they, the reason I say is you might want to say to everybody, you know, come if you have an idea, like put whatever document you want and like come with like a five minute pitch or a three minute pitch. Yeah. You know? um, it might be good to even like we're presenting all the data like before like enrollment study was out beforehand like if we could have like even just a flavor of a few of the ideas that are going to get floated to send out with the agenda that people can start thinking about them well if we made a big splash about it like submit your ideas so that people can look at that, like you know an actual uh, like a one pager or something so that everybody can look over them and know what they're expecting so it's not a surprise, like, because I think that's where things get confusing. Yeah, and I think there's like room for also like spur of the moment, or not spur of yeah. the moment, but you know what I mean? Like, oh, I didn't have time to do my write up. Like, I think we should give some breathing room to that, but if it's avoidable, I don't think everything needs to be spur of the moment. Yeah, I mean, because we can Yeah, so I'll see if Dana and Jan's as well. Uh, yeah, Jan's calling her. Willing to take that. As yeah. recently yeah. as April first, they reached out. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're specifically about this. Yeah. Well, I mean, to help. Oh. If, if you're, you know, I guess when there were some struggles and other things, but they've stayed kind of plugged in. So yeah, yeah they, they they've, they've done a lot of really cool work. Um, yeah. Peter, April, and I were on it too before. Oh, that's right. So <laughs> so so going back to the next Monday. Yeah. So so. <laughs> So can we push presentations to the 29th? And basically the 29th is all readouts. It's the survey and the subcommittee presentations. And we don't stop, we don't, um, we would, that would force us to push the workshop for, and only have one week of, of workshopping. One, two hour session, which might be all we need really to help, you know, people already have the idea in their heads. And, you know, um, and then from, so that would then push that to the, uh, what's that, the eighth? I think I don't have a calendar. Can I, I do have the calendar open? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are
are you pushing things because infrastructure is not ready to present? Is, is every other subcommittee ready? I mean, we just gave them Finance slides today. Ready. I don't know we that anybody's seen ready. The infrastructure. I, I think I think infrastructure and finance are in the same place. I mean, our charge to write are is to ready? verify. Yeah. So we can do one of them. Programming I just, is ready. I think we could push infrastructure to be ready. I think we just we we would have to meet probably Thursday or Friday. <laughs> I got half of them still standing here. So <laughs> and the mics are on. No, I look. That group is so full of energy and ideas that the conversations. It's really and, and I wasn't even in most of the discussion today because I was off back. But they really struggle to get off to stay on track because there's just a ton of great energy there and and, so and our questions the questions for the infrastructure subcommittee are a mix of verifying what is available through site tours and building evaluations and the harriman report and then there's this other kind of finance budget related questions like putting numbers to renovation costs and we just think we get our wheels yeah and then in finance has the same issue that we don't understand the assumptions that went into the harem soon to drive those numbers and without a lot of detail it's hard to then say the numbers are valid it's so i so, i pushed infrastructure pretty hard today to present what was verifiable or what is our observations based on the work that we've done and to kind of just acknowledge that there's a subset of questions that we can't answer and yeah I I, that's I don't know well, what, it, how it, we would answer them. I think the other half of it is like, will one week really help? Right. Like, it, Harriman might get back and be like, oh, here are all the answers to your questions. Or it's just going to be like another week of like, we still, we still don't have the information we need to do. Do it. Okay. So it seems like the consensus is we still stayed in the 22nd report out and they may be limited, qualified. Report out. Yeah. Some, some things may have to just be turfed to phase two. I, I mean, yeah. I, I, and that's the thing is, you know, Nick and Leanne and you and I develop, help develop those questions. And those were really, I mean, from my perspective, those were really just to kind of give the group some focus and they weren't like, you, you must answer all of these questions. It was more just to like, I've, Friend channel people's energy, and so. All right. So the next question is: If there's going to be three groups, how long do you think each group will need to present? Take an hour today. That was very clear. Well, but I, but I think enrollment was one of the more controversial ones, right? Still, I don't. But she presented for thirty minutes before we got to questions, right? But but part of that is because she took. She asked, she told me last night, she took some of the questions that she got and she addressed the questions in her. So that, that's, that made the Q&A section shorter. Yeah. Um, 30 well, minutes, I think. I, I think you're gonna, 30 minutes per, that could, that's 90 minutes of the, of the day, right? I was gonna say, if you shoot for like 30 each, you've got to flex 30 that, oh, it, wow, this uh, is not done. We've got like a little bit of wiggle room then like booking into two hour slot and then we're, 8.30 and everyone's frustrated because they want to go home. Yeah. yeah. I think for benchmark, you see probably at least a half hour. Yeah, at I don't least. think we're too controversial of a topic. Did you say at least a half hour? <laughs> you need more. Like, oh, wait, you think it, I, I was going to say 30 is a good comfortable spot for us. Yeah, I think we need at least a half hour. 50 well, minutes to pres present and then grab some questions. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That, that, 15, 15. What's yeah, just try and break it. 15 for presentation, 15 for questions. So that, that pretty much is that. Yeah. Okay. Public yeah. comment, yeah. adjournment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I meant on that to agenda. I didn't mean to adjourn us. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the, I think the only things that, that we said we talk about tonight from Steve's were Steve Hanley's email questions. Do you want to brainstorm that stuff now? Well, I just think. You know, I think Steve raises a good question about just being having access to some of the stuff. I mean, for the presentations, I had thought it was really good to get the enrollment presentation ahead of time. 
because then you could kind of, I mean, I, at least I couldn't see the screens like it is, but I think our timetable for our, that's going to, for us, it's going to be kind of tough. To yeah, do that. Way. Not, not like I, we go back to infrastructure and tell them this final draft is due yeah. next Monday. We'll be lucky to get the final draft done by Monday. By yeah. Monday. Monday. So they'll be finishing Monday. at three o'clock on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I still think that Steve's question, I think we should, you know, whatever documents we have, we're trying to post to, can they get, can Steve get to those documents? Yeah, that's my question. Does he have access to the Google Drive? No, he, he, does. he does. He yeah, has he for it. Someone has to forward He's not on the committee? No, he's, he's not. not. He's, he asked he's for it. We told him no. Um, and so now he's asking for all the documents that are on the drive. Yeah. yeah I was going to say all those docs for benchmarking are on the drive. But. Ours too. Everything. We've been taking Maybe really good notes. Maybe so why could we have, aren't they public? Yeah, he can have them. Uh, it's so easy. Well, well, we before someone has sent it to him. Uh, the school didn't want to, well, maybe could, but Diane didn't want to open up the access. To the it, no, we can still, we can what still, you like, you can download no it as a trust. PDF or something and send anything to anybody. Like, any one of he us. You can, can have the that. contents of yeah. the folders. It's just a matter of. He can't, he folders. can't get access to the folders. And the truth is that that would be an uh, un, un, yeah, it would be crazy. But we can, we could ask people if you're, you know, whatever documents you're talking about in your subcommittees, you're reporting about, you know, please send us a link to those and we will just put them in the agenda. Um, that is a solution. Um, that's kind of how we- It's a slippery slope, right? Like I, I have no problem sharing whatever we want to share. I don't think there's anything in here that's, yeah. that's, secret right no, none of the all. working documents but and and steve is probably the only one who's going to ask for it so yeah so, so, yeah. so i don't so, mind so, 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 the committee she can get it she, yeah. right so like i don't mind it but it is a slippery like if anybody from the community just starts emailing and saying hey i want that spreadsheet i want a copy of that uh, give me a copy of that and where'd you get that number and, and before you know it your whole week is sending documents to people yeah so no, that, why did you skip this one? Why right, and then all the questions, right? So like, this number and again, it's not about lack of transparency. It's about can we manage, if, if it were to, if probably highly unlikely that the community suddenly gets a spark and starts asking for data. I'm just, my, my point is only to say that it is a slippery slope that we get over, for the same reason that, you know, we weren't going to make, the school wasn't going to make an exception in grant Steve access to the folders was because that, that is definitely a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope, right? So are we are we prepared if more than Steve starts asking for stuff? Are we prepared to to give every member of the community the same level of attention that we give to Steve? Well, can, we have, we, can we send them to some other site that they well, can get? But to, then that's that's what I mean about the two. agenda. If, if we're referencing a document, I mean, like it, the town council does this. They, they, that's why their packets are four hundred pages. But um, you know, if we're if we're referencing, <laughs> sorry, I closed my eyes literally that the thought of the packet for Wednesday. And these guys all chuckled. So. <laughs> I saw the fatigue. Yes, yeah, literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah. I mean, the, but they are. Yeah, we include every everything. like you know when the DEI committee meets. If they reference a document that they're working on internally in the school, too bad. It has to go in the in the agenda. That's a public document now. Um, they they work it by just popping a link into the agenda. But Peter has a good point. Like, is there just a I don't know that this exists, but is there a, a place that we can just like basically mirror what drive. the Google Drive and the just like I mean somebody would have to manually go in and add. So if you're Get if them all the PDFs if, and upload them. Right. Well, if you're working on the documents. Yeah, I don't know what that. Right. I mean, it would be and a lift to say the least. I, I can we just say no, bring your questions to the SBAC committee. They couldn't present it if necessary. No. Or say we'll be well, part of the agenda packet. Or before well, the, the meeting. Well, but part of the problem is I think what Steve sometimes is asking for is things that I mean the agenda is a pretty and I understand that Steve is very engaged, but at the same range, we can't do something for one person. There's 25,000 people in yeah. Scarborough. 
all of whom are entitled to that. Exactly. So think right. about that. I mean, one if they all say, well, look, we're going to all make a point of request. You'd have to hire full time staff. So well, we, we would never want to do it. I yeah. think you have to find a way to make it public. Uh, not no, disagreeing that we'll make it public, but I don't you're think you're going to have the distrust. If, if this report well, no, all day, every day, day to the and people family. didn't get what they wanted to participate, they're not. It's a trust issue again. It's going to go way up. Distrust. I mean, what are they hiding on those was, documents? There was zero criteria to join the committee. So right. the, anybody that doesn't have trust in the process could have could have been part of the process. I mean, there is that too, right? Yeah, except for there, there was the, the cost of having to be here. Every three excuses, of which for some that's. Yeah. But can can it can it go just to the, the Scarborough School page documents that, well, that, so that we, somebody has to manage? Well, that. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it, well, well, if I'm, I guess my question though for like for that though, Peter, is some of the documents that I think Steve wants are working documents. Mm -hmm. Like infrastructure has a spreadsheet and we've just been putting each school building and then we've been putting the deficiencies in this big one yeah. single document. If we were gonna share that, it would have to be made into a PDF and then shared and it would only be, he'd only be getting that snapshot. Yeah. And then when, like, what's the schedule for updating that PDF, well, wherever I, that PDF lives? Yeah, so, like, it just not becomes... only that, like, when, when they're working documents, like, I could go put anything I want in that spreadsheet, right? Capture so we it could, for we've a got minute. a bunch of, we got a bunch of people here that are doing their own math on cost estimates, and they go, oh, this is how much it actually costs. Right. And, and that goes to the public. And, yeah. It's not verifiable. It's somebody's back of the napkin math, and the public gets a hold of it and goes, well, why was it 160 million to build a school? It should have only cost 40 million based That's on true, the math that I saw in the in the advisory committee's work. Right. So there's there's that so when so that's why I think originally, you know, we should anything that's ready for public consumption should be available to the public. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that's ready. Yeah. But working documents have to be working documents. We're, we're an Is advisory committee for you know, providing your recommendation, we need we need space to work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is it possible to do like a, a final readout? Like we can like the presentations for next week, those can go and like I think they should. Sure. 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 Those are published. published. Yeah. yeah. I think all of those, and then if there are finalized, verified supporting documentation, that was kind of what my email was suggestion was. So so like the enrollment study today, that presentation should be available. And then any documents and any data that she referenced in that to get to where her recommendation was should all be public. Right. So she yeah. now exactly her spreadsheets where she did math and her formulas and stuff, you know, that maybe doesn't need to be, but it but the data that got to where she got to should all be public. So how yeah. do we do that? that? I mean, that's the question. It's already on the school website. It's already on the school yeah. website. So everything yeah. that she yeah. presented yeah. was there. It's out there now. It's on there. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm hearing is if, if a committee is in the midst of working on a document that's not ready yet for public consumption, um, then we're not necessarily sending those out. Yeah, okay. um, but, but if we have something that is being presented, it should be yeah. in with the agenda for sure. I think it's the same, use the same criteria we're using for town council or the school board. Yeah. I mean, that when last... it is finalized, it's public information. And until that point, it's a working document. Yeah. I mean, they did put the enrollment in the yeah. last agenda, so they did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And just See. try, I mean, it right. can be as consistent as we can and yeah. make sure that the, the agenda packets have all of our supporting documents that are final. Yeah, yeah and make sure I'm that. Sorry, do you need the agenda or the um, minutes? When, so for the enrollment stuff that went today, for example, the, the PowerPoint presentation was a, was a link okay. on the calendar. The oh, that that's was, right. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 and it wasn't it wasn't the agenda that went out to the whole yeah. years group as well. And that makes it so easy that, for people. I use some of those today when I looked at so the newsletter, the town newsletter. I said, "Oh, well, we sh we should do it. We should hundred percent. We should do it. This week you're going to be you're going to have to challenge because yes. I don't think people are going to be having their presentations yeah. writing for next I Monday. And we're just going to have to update the links on the calendar." Yeah. 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 We can okay. we can say these will be on the website yeah. within 24 hours. Okay. So then, right. so here, here's what we need to do then. When we send out, we need to get a communication to the committee. 
clarifying because I, I know at least our committee thinks we have two weeks to get their presentations ready. Um, okay. They have one week, so we need to get that. Yeah, the building infrastructure. So yeah. we need to get a communication out to the to the SBC clarifying that all presentations are due. We'll, we'll, all presentations will be on Monday, the 22nd. Yeah. And what's the drop dead timeline to have slides published? When do we need them to be ready for? I think you give I, it to me. I love starting I think, your <laughs> I think Monday. I just we have to get the Yeah, we do. We, and I yeah. put it right in the agenda to please click back. Uh, you know, Monday afternoon by four o'clock and agenda, you know, the presentations okay. will be available. It's not beautiful, but it's a compromise for this one, one little blip. Or, or do we just commit looking? will be public on Tuesday. I would, be, I would lean towards public on Tuesday if it's like acceptable for everyone because I mean, we're already having a big ask of like a team who thinks that it's two Same weeks out. Week. <laughs> And like, they may say like, oh my goodness, can Don't we be. crash it at like, everyone's out of work at 5 p.m. work till six, six. and like, uh, oh my. So like, I think we already are asking kind of a big thing. We're back in our college days, yeah. currently for that yeah. group presentation. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be going my, through my our presentation, still working. For a group presentation. Oh, and like, oh I, I wouldn't be weary of like having like a free free. Um, like someone's like, oh my goodness, we had to throw this last thing in. Which one's the final one? All yeah. those like, let's. Yeah. I think if setting up for success then, would be doing it Tuesday. Yeah. Publish as present. Yeah. I'll take I'll, I'll take the hit on this, Peter. That's my I I, I thought we had two thing. weeks. I don't know why, and it's right in my project yeah, I, plan that it's next week. So. I, Sure. Charlie, you can't make mistakes. <laughs> you can't be human. <laughs> they'll they'll roll. They, they, that group, yeah, that group will right. roll. They'll be all right. They'll rise to the occasion. They will. Okay. Anything else? Um, I will not be there. Okay. I apologize. So, so me neither. I so, made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to help get all of this stuff to Steve. I, I, I literally opened up my email to I, I can't oh, even oh, get oh, it. So. I, I get the stuff. So I'll just let you know. Good luck with the party. Okay. So you saw anything as well. So excited. My husband started balloon blow up. Did he? Yeah. Ah. My daughter picked up found yeah I gotta look it up and you know and you know tell me I, I want to. I did a podcast once. Steve, I'm sorry. I can't. Like all the dairy. So I. Steve, Steve is. You want him inside? No, I. I. I, 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 I love that. I'm 